this paper is um, is uh, uh, this paper and this presentation is, uh, is part of a, uh, of a work I'm trying to do with some colleagues on uh, economic elites in Morocco. So um, I'll start my presentation with uh, coming coming back again uh, to kind of theoretical issues which are very important for us in order to before tackling uh, empirical issues, I think it's important to try to uh, understand what we are talking about. Uh, so discussing the notion of chronic capitalism. So I'm, com I com I'm coming from sociology and in sociology we are not using the concept of co chronic capitalism. We are using, uh, you ha we have other studies. We have for instance, neo-patrimonial state, uh, term used by some colleagues. We have also um, uh, traditional uh, Marxist analysis and other, uh, and other 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 stuff that are other concepts that are used to to study capitalism in uh, in Morocco in the region and all over the world. Um, so when we talk about chronic capitalism, when I started studying uh, deeply this concept, I found out that it is a concept that has been developed in the context of uh, Asian developmental state, uh, meaning that development state that there are states that are. Uh, trying to develop the, the countries, they have succeeded sometimes. Uh, many of them succeed to to, to develop their uh, their economy. So I was just wondering if it is a valid concept for North African countries where we have we don't we don't have uh, this developmental state. Uh, in uh, the, the the context uh, we have, uh, domination of clans and families is not always done through regulation and policies. We can find also that when we when we work on the economic history of Morocco or also other countries in North Africa, we found that privatizations and neoliberal reforms are also used to accumulate economic resource, meaning that. Um, uh, economic elites are coping with reforms in order to find loopholes or even you being sometimes pioneers in, in adopting this, uh, this uh, financial devices, if we can use this, uh, this, uh, this concept. So um, in the context of Moroccan listed companies, I, I focus in this study. I have also some, some research I'm, I'm finishing and publishing. This one is only focused on Moroccan listed companies because we have the data on board memberships and also other data. Uh, so I study the, the role of financial sector. I focus on financial sector and what I call crony interlocutors, which are interlocks are uh, common board members. So crony board members, uh, their role in clans accumulation. accumulation. So the methodology I use is not, um, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to find causality. I'm rather trying to, find, to, to, find, uh, to do a, a very good description. Because in social science, a good dis description, a very good description, may be a first step in order to do, to try to find uh, to, uh, explanations, uh, to understand why people do this and do not do that. So it's not, uh, it's not about correlations. So let's come back to economic history of Morocco. So the economic history of banking sector in Morocco. Uh, there is first a concept that has been developed by Abdel Qadir Barada uh, in 1984, which is le pouvoir bancaire, or bank's power. When you study Mor uh, Morocco, the, the trajectory of Moroccan history, economic history, you find out that banks were central uh, to control economy. Uh, when, when, when the French uh, wanted to to establish protectorate in Morocco, one of the main things they have done is that the bank, La Banque de Paris et des Pays-Bas, uh, had uh, the right to issue uh, money. It was Bank of Paris et Pays-Bas that controlled bank, uh, bank of the state uh, uh, when the protectorate, when the protectorate was established in Morocco. So, and the bank, uh, the, this bank was also controlling many companies in the Moroccan economy, uh, chemin de fer, uh, railways, uh, and so on. And it was very important in, 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 uh, uh, during the French protectorate. Afterwards, we had in Morocco what we call Moroccanization, which is different from nationalization, meaning that the shareholders, uh, there is a, uh, shareholders are becoming more and more Moroccan. They can be state-owned, it can become state-owned, but it can also uh, be both by Moroccan private uh, actors. So it's more, uh, they call it la Marocanisation. Uh, and this Marocanisation uh, uh, induced what Saidi called uh, the emergence of family group holding uh, around one charismatic individual. We still see this in Morocco. 
And those uh, family groups are related in some ways with banks. These banks can be private banks, but they can, but they, in, the, in the period of the 70s and 80s, they were mainly public uh, state-owned banks like Bendu. There was lots of studies on the relation, the, how Bendu helped uh, development of uh, private companies in these industrial uh, sectors. And right now we find that uh, the banking sector is largely dominated by the royal monarchy, uh, not only the banking sector, but uh, the, uh, the economy in general, by the royal monarchy, and, but not alone. And it's lies, what we call lies, uh, and they are using financial institutions, and not only here, not only banks, because you have also, uh, you have uh, the, the banks cannot loan, uh, you, uh, they cannot, uh, uh, have uh, give loans. They have um, a limit. The bank have limits, so uh, they need they they uh, you need to have pension fund to fund fund your project and so on. So uh, not only banks, but also here we, we in the late uh, last years we noticed the major role of some other other financial institutions such as pension fund. So. Why uh, the uh, right holding family and other actors are investing? banks and financial institutions. The first uh, explanation, and this is rather qualitative, uh, some interviews that I have done um, enable me to distinguish two kind of uh, possible explanations. The first one is rather political. In the beginning, this is an interview. Uh, someone told me, who was one executive of one of the important groups in Morocco, he was in, 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 uh, involved in this, uh, the establishment of this strategy. He told me that in the beginning of the 20s, there was a risk that a huge part of the financial se sector would come under the control of the French shareholders, and he gave, gave me many examples of um, uh, holding families that wanted to, to sell their, their, their assets to French uh, interests. So this is, the, and they, they told me that they didn't want that, so they, they engaged in, they bought uh, Wafa Bank from the Group Titani, and they also stopped BMCE. They, they, um, they asked the government to, to ask BMCE to, to not to, to, to sell to, to French uh, credit, Caisse uh, I think. Yes, Caisse d'Epargne. The second explanation that came from uh, other, other, uh, other uh, private actors that told me that they invest in the banking sector because it was really profitable. Uh, and we will discuss it later, but those two explanations can converge, meaning that uh, it can also, uh, we can also have two motivations, which is not uh, uh, impossible. And we have, so we have a concentrated and profitable banking sector in Morocco. We have three listed banks, main bank that control 65% of assets, deposits, and loans. And the profitability of banking, if you measure it by return on equity, has increased in Morocco from 1% to, in 2002, uh, to 10.2% uh, in 2014. So my, my case study here, I'm uh, focusing on only on listed companies. So it is a limited study. So it is just, I just try to describe what I see. And we, I cannot generalize it on big companies, neither on the whole economy. Uh, so it's 73 uh, Moroccan listed companies. Uh, what we see uh, when we analyze the net profit of this company is that we have a, uh, a re representativeness of financial groups, especially banks, are very important. Uh, we have Atijari of Bank, BCP, uh, and BMCU are among the companies that have net profit more than one billion dirhams. So uh, this is about the profitability of companies. Uh, let's say now uh, the methodology that I used to describe uh, network among those listed companies. So I use what we call interlocks. Uh, they are relational attribute. So it's, it's an attribute that is related to connections, not to uh, personal or organizational attribute. Um, we say that there is an interlock between two firms when they, have, they share the same board member. And here I'm using uh, a graph uh, from a, a, a book of a, a, an American uh, academic scholar that studies uh, ec American economy. Here we can we can do we can draw two two kind of networks. So the um, so um, 
we, we have board members that sit in, uh, we have people sitting in board members of different companies. So we have people, we have three people here, and we have companies. Sorry? Uh, we, have, we have people and we have companies. We can draw either a network of people or a network of companies. For instance, we have uh, uh, Sarah Lee, uh, which is a company. Uh, it shares the same, uh, the same board. If we, if we take manpower, it shares two. She has, uh, yeah, the company has two common board members with manpower. So between Sarah Lee and manpower, we have uh, uh, two links and so on. She has only one, uh, one link between, there is only one link between Sarah Lee and Emerson Electric and one link between L3M and Sarah Lee and one link between Boeing and Sarah Lee. And if we consider it in terms of individuals uh, between Willie, um, uh, between Willie Dav Davis and, uh, and Vernon, Vernon Jordan, we have uh, only one link because they share only one same company, which is Sarah Lee. Uh, but if we consider Willie Davis and Roseanne Ridgeway, they, they, sh they share two links because they share Manpower and Sarah Lee as common. They, they, they both sit in the same uh, board uh, of the two companies. So uh, in network analysis studies, uh, uh, the way I, w I work traditionally is that I go and ask people to whom you ask for advice in order to understand the links between people. But uh, when you work on a very, very limited elite, you, you cannot access all the people because it's almost 200 or 300 uh, board members. Uh, what, I what I have tried to do is that to have a proxy of these links that exist between two people. Because two people sitting on the same board are not necessarily exchanging information. But uh, it's, uh, it's an indicator that those people, if they sit in many boards, it, that they will meet together two, three times a, a, a year and they may exchange information. So the fact of having, uh, the fact of being interlocal mean that you have more access to information that is being exchanged informally in the in board and in uh, outside the boards. Uh, so in the real, uh, concerning companies, we can say also that the group of companies that is cohesive and connected to other groups have a strategic location compared to those who are isolated. It's, it's an hypothesis, it may be false or, or true, but this is something I try to, uh, to, to, to check by interviews because I have some in-depth interviews with, uh, with board members, but not all of them, in order to understand the importance of being in the board or not being participating to board. So here, one of the first results I have. Uh, so here, I first draw the network of companies, and then I try to uh, shrink companies uh, according to their sector of activity in order to see what is the place of finance. And when I do this, I find out that people, that board members from financial companies, they, uh, they used to, to sit together a lot compared to others. And they also, uh, they also are uh, sitting in, in, the in boards of credit, agri agro-business, bus construction, industry. So I, I say that they are very central in the network. Meaning that it's not the, this means that, for instance, finance is sitting in the board of industry, but also industry is sitting in the same board. Here we don't have a directed relation. It's not that finance go to the board of, of industry. It's that they sit together in the same, in the same board. So this is just an indicator of uh, that finance are very present and very central in the, in the network. If we forgot about the name of the companies, the sector, so we only analyze the relational attribute, having link or not having a link, we have, uh, we have this, uh, this hierarchical clustering, which is a uh, methodology that has been used to, to see the proximity or this, the similarity and dissimilarity based only or rela on relation attributes. This is, this, this is not taken into consideration the sector or the name of the company or other things. Uh, just take into consideration the fact of having uh, the same links and the same absence of links. And this uh, provides me with some interesting re results because I find companies that are, uh, of course, this Benjeloon group is a well-known holding company. So the six companies where Benjeloon is investing, it's normal that they, we have it here. The Royal Holding SNI, it's 
quite normal to have it as a group, homogen group. Uh, even Ben Saleh, which uh, two companies of Ben Saleh are quite clear. But the interesting, interesting result is Moulah Fid Alami, which is the, uh, the current Ministry of Industry in Morocco. You right have now. five more minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, who is um, with companies that are not part of his, uh, of his group. Uh, it's, he's, so he's in alliance with other holding families like Benani Group, La Belle Vie, and, uh, and the Stock Vizla, Elish holding family. So, and the others do not represent a cohesive, a cohesive group. So this is interlocks of uh, people. Of, uh, uh, so I just show you uh, the results of the degree centrality, which is the main uh, result of my study. This is the main interlocutors, those who are sitting in the uh, high number of boards. When we analyze them, uh, we see that they are mainly private, uh, representing private companies, that they are coming from financial companies, uh, either banks or sometimes bank and insurances. And they, I, I measure the proximity with the monarchy using the Royal, Fo uh, Royal Foundation, philanthropy of, uh, related to, to the monarch. And I find that many of them, I think 10, uh, sorry, uh, seven among 10 are members of boards of this Royal Foundation. So the con one of the conclusions I have in this uh, is that in, uh, so uh, I, I will finish with the last, with the last uh, co conclusion, which is that Boone and Henry, and Henry which, uh, they have done one of the main papers on uh, uh, banking sector in the region. Uh, had described the banking sector in Morocco as a private oligopoly. Here we evidence, and we try to describe, that uh, the monarchy and it, in its entourage are capturing corporate governance inst instruments, such as board membership, to control economic activities. And the next steps uh, will be to compare this case study with the business stage relationships in Tunisia in order to see if there is a different path depending on the way each elite has faith the Arab Spring. Moroccan strategy, uh, this is another paper in French that I'm trying to, to, to publish in a book, is um, this new strategy of the lease is uh, to invest in sub-Saharan African countries because there has uh, some divergences with the European and the US. And we can also uh, uh, think about interregional cronyism. Like for instance, we have Etijari Wafabong that was in Tunisia, I think, uh, investing with the one relative of the family Ben Ali, and now they are investing in Barclay, they bought Barclay Bank Egypt. And the methodology will be to try to collect the data on board memberships and do in-depth in interviews uh, to extend it to other countries if it's possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.